general relativity is the most accurate theory we have for describing and understanding space-time and gravity. At its heart are the Einstein equations, which can be simply thought of as being one formulation of equating the curvature of space-time to gravity, thus describing gravity as the bending of both space and time around mass, or more accurately, energy, instead of as a classical force. It is important to test the predictions of this theory to ensure it faithfully captures reality and can predict the outcome of experiments. This is the scientific method and is how humanity develops knowledge about our universe over time. In this video, I'm going to discuss the different tests for general relativity, including the original three proposed by Einstein, as well as further tests developed over time, explaining what general relativity predicts about our universe and hopefully helping you to understand one of the greatest physics successes of the 20th century and how we can be sure it is accurate and trustworthy. Albert Einstein published his new theory of gravity in 1915, along with three different tests or results which should come from it. The first was the prediction of the precession of elliptical orbits. This one wasn't a novel test, but rather a prediction from general relativity, as the precession in the perihelion position of Mercury had already been well known for some time. In general relativity, in the weak field limit, the equation for an elliptical orbit of a body around another can be derived and compared to the classical Newtonian formulation. There's similar terms in both that can be attributed to things like angular momentum conservation, but in the GR prediction there's an additional term which corresponds to the shifting of the orbit. This manifests physically as the entire orbit moving within a plane or processing after each complete period. An exaggerated depiction is shown here, showing the predicted precession from GR. In reality, for most things like planets, which orbit stars, the size of this precession is rather small. It's strongest for objects orbiting close to the centre of the larger body, and so in our solar system, Mercury's orbit is likeliest to have the largest precession which we can measure as it orbits closest to the Sun. The mathematics of general relativity predict the orbit of Mercury to precess by an angle of only 0.0000005 radians per orbit, an angle so small we can't detect it. However, this effect is cumulative, and so this angle gets added after every orbit. So after many years, with Mercury completing a full orbit once every 88 days, this deviation adds up and we can measure the precession as the shifting of the perihelion position of Mercury. This precession was known about and measured for a long time well before Einstein and GR, and so wasn't a novel test but more of an explanation of this observation using general relativity. Interestingly, this precession has also been observed more recently in other orbits, such as the highly elliptical orbit of a star, which passes closely to the central supermassive black hole of our own galaxy, Sagittarius A star. I mentioned how this precession increases for objects orbiting closer to larger objects. The star in question only orbits 120 astronomical units away from the supermassive black hole at its point of closest approach. The central black hole has a mass of around 4.3 million times that of the Sun, allowing us to measure the precession between subsequent complete orbits. The next test was the first novel test of general relativity which was first performed in 1919, and that is the predicted bending of light around a massive object. In GR, large masses distort spacetime, meaning that even massless particles such as photons, which constitute light, should also have their motion affected by the presence of a massive object. The way this was tested back in 1919 was by trying to detect the deflection in the path of starlight due to the mass of the Sun. Obviously, this is difficult to do as the large amount of light flux we detect from the Sun here on Earth vastly outshines the flux we receive from any distant stars. It's like trying to look for stars during daytime. The Sun's light dominates all the light we can see from space. The way this was worked around was by waiting until a total solar eclipse and so the light from the Sun gets blocked out by the Moon. That's exactly what Arthur Eddington did on the 29th of May 1919, allowing his team to observe deviations in the path of starlight as it almost grazes the Sun. The deflection of light due to the Sun's mass was directly observed, which was a famous result at the time, showing that GR was not just capable of explaining pre-existing problems such as the precession in the orbit of Mercury, but also able to suggest new experiments and derive results. Of course, not many people decided looking at the Sun to look for the deflection of starlight was a good idea before Einstein came along. Einstein's final original test for general relativity is detecting the gravitational redshift, GR predicts that light should experience a wavelength or frequency shift when it escapes a gravitational well. Imagine the spacetime that gets bent around a large star. In order for light to escape the spacetime distortion caused by the high mass of the star, it must lose energy. You can kind of think of this classically as the photon doing work against the gravitational field, 
and so it must lose energy, which results in the frequency decreasing, or equivalently, its wavelength increasing, leading to redshifting of the light. This result can also be argued by considering what would happen if you dropped a mass from a large height here on Earth, which was then converted into a photon of light at the surface. Since energy is conserved, the emitted photon must have energy equal to the rest mass energy of the fallen object, plus the gravitational potential energy due to it falling from a height. If this photon travelled upwards back to the point of where the mass was dropped, and then its energy was converted back into a mass, you would end up with more mass than you started with if the light hadn't lost energy as it travelled upwards. This could then be repeated, essentially creating an infinite free energy machine which we know cannot be possible as it violates almost every law of physics. Therefore, instead, the light travelling upwards must lose energy in the form of gravitational redshift as it attempts to escape Earth's gravitational field. General relativity relies on the equivalence principle, which states that the gravitational and inertial mass of an object are equal. Therefore, for this to be true, gravitational redshift must occur, otherwise energy is not conserved in this thought experiment, which would mean GR is wrong in its assumption of the equivalence principle. In 1925, the gravitational redshift of light from the white dwarf star Sirius B was directly detected by observing its effect on the wavelength of the spectral emission lines of its starlight, another success for GR. Beyond these three original tests proposed by Einstein, other tests have been put forward and completed since. One in particular is the Shapiro time delay, suggested by the physicist Erwin Shapiro in the 1960s. The Shapiro time delay is the increase in time it takes for a radar signal to travel past a massive object than compared to if the object wasn't there. Imagine a photon travelling through space. If there's a large mass like a star close to its path of motion, then, if general relativity is correct, the mass of the star should distort space-time around it which causes the photon to not travel in a straight line, instead following a bent path due to the distorted space-time around the star. The time taken for this photon to be recorded by an observer then is longer than compared to a photon which seemingly travels the same distance but not near a massive object, and so would take a straight path through space-time. The star distorts the photon's path, making it take longer than the straight line through space-time it would have taken if the star wasn't there, as the speed of light does not vary and any line other than the straight line between two points is a longer path, and so takes longer to arrive for things moving at a constant speed. This is the Shapiro time delay. Shapiro himself measured this by bouncing radar signals off of Venus and calculating the change in round-trip travel time compared to when the Earth and Venus were not obstructed by the Sun, and then again when the Sun was in between. The time delay has also been measured using other planets since then, and with distant stars. Other results due to general relativity include the gravitational lensing of light around galaxy clusters, which we know is similar to the bending of starlight around the Sun due to its mass, but taken to galactic levels. Another somewhat recent test was performed by LIGO when gravitational waves were directly detected back in 2016. Here, the crashing together of supermassive objects such as black holes should cause ripples in the fabric of space-time to propagate out over the universe, which we call gravitational waves. This causes less than atomic changes in lengths, which vary over time. Einstein thought humanity would never be able to detect it directly. Lo and behold, many decades after his death, the team at LIGO detected them directly in 2016, adding more irrefutable evidence in favour of general relativity compared to classical Newtonian gravity models. The theory of general relativity is incredible, but just as incredible are the profound experiments which go into rigorously testing it. New tests and results of experiments for GR are cropping up every year, and so far Einstein's gravity has withstood every single one of them to the highest degree. Thanks for watching. I hope you all enjoyed and I'll see you next time.